OK, welcome back to Efficient Algorithms. We're finally leaving behind all the topics that are often covered in undergraduate computer science classes as well, to some degree, and now uh, start some, some exciting topics that go well beyond that. Now, the first such topic is uh, this one, Unit 5, Parallel Algorithms. So we'll look at how you can, on a conceptual algorithmic level, take advantage of the fact that Basically, all computers we have, apart from the smaller embedded devices, have multiple threads of execution, multiple cores. And so uh, you, need to, you need to specifically program them to take advantage of that. That's what we'll look at. Uh, my goal for you is to know uh, some fundamental strategies, how you can parallelize problems. We'll keep it away from the actual code. and. Uh, this is unfortunately one of the one of the case, cases where I can blame it on the technical side. The software tools for parallel programming are not as convenient yet as they have become for standard programming, sequential programming. So some of the things we'll touch on here uh, need a lot more engineering work to be fast in practice than the sequential methods, just because there's more technicalities involved, at least at this point. Um, I want you to also be able to say when a problem is not possibly sped up by parallel algorithms. And uh, we'll look at the formal machine models for that, that allows such statements. Uh, we'll analyze algorithms, and that will require a little rethinking of, of what we mean by time. And we'll look at some concrete methods uh, where the parallel algorithms are interesting. We'll look at more, but these are the, the non-trivial parallel algorithms. We'll start with the models, and then we'll look basically at, at two problems, string matching in parallel and sorting. And for sorting, we'll need some intermediate steps that maybe don't make, don't are so excited in, in exciting in isolation, but without them, it seems really tough to get other problems going. So these are, again, fundamental building blocks, and we'll put it all together in, in the last part. Before we set the stage for that, let me ask uh, how much experience you have with parallel programming. Because this tends to vary a lot. I think we have very few students from the um, big data program. They usually do a little more of uh, OpenMP, MPI. Uh, you, you do a little bit of that. Well, what course is that? OK, yeah. So you, you, will, you will do a little bit of that. Uh, you, will, you will see how it contrasts to what we'll uh, discuss. Um, and maybe uh, enjoy the less tedious parts. OK, I've only had 25 votes for the, for the um, join code. And more here, so I'll probably show the code again, I guess. Um, OK, so a few of you among the seven have done this. Uh, but also, a lot of people have never touched any, any parallel programming. Now, I mean, this is probably a a large chunk of the people who haven't really programmed before starting this course. Uh, so it's kind of obvious. But I think the, the subset of people who've done programming and parallel programming is much smaller than the set of all programmers. It's something that people are usually not so familiar with. There are many different types of things that could be called programming in parallel. So it's, uh, it's also in the details of what that exactly means. Let me switch back to the um, attendance code, and we'll move on. I probably should have also asked if you've seen parallel algorithms before. I guess the answer is no for most. At least uh, it's very rare that this is taught in undergraduate classes. All right, why, why do we care at all? Uh, if you have a lot of money to solve a problem, you can buy lots of computers. 
maybe uh, unless there's global shortage of semiconductors. Uh, but let's leave that aside. This is a, when I wrote that, there was none. Um, <laughs> and uh, things, things will get better. In principle, money can still buy you lots of computers. Maybe just not some of the chips. Uh, but that alone doesn't make a program faster. It, it can't buy you time uh, if you want to solve a certain problem really fast. Uh, you have to make it work on several computers at the same time. And that, that can be a challenge. Now let's uh, jump right in into a distinguish, uh, to, to distinguish two notions, which both can be called parallel computation. But they're very different in the techniques, and that's why we have to focus on one of them. Uh, the, the one that we'll look at is a shared memory parallel computer. So you can imagine it's one big device um, which has shared memory. That's the distinctive feature. So all the processing parts can access the same memory. Uh, but there's several processors. So to avoid using any specific technical jargon, uh, I'll just say processing elements, which is standard terminology in the algorithms uh, literature on, on, on parallelism where a processing element can be a single core, or it can be a hyper-thread core, or it could also be an entire machine as part of a supercomputer. So supercomputers somewhere are in between those two. It's sometimes a bit um, tough to make the clear cut. OK, let me finish this first, though. Shared memory that everyone can access, but several individual pieces that can compute. OK. Uh, there's also the main communication between these different pieces that compute happening through memory. So there's certain, they can, they can make this up. We'll have to program them to do it. But they can say memory location 42 is a special memory location. I use this to send, to send messages by writing some specific value there. The typical thing of this, uh, I think this is still, this is still basically the same numbers. So you can buy these machines, beefy big compute servers, uh, a lot of cores, but not those thousands, maybe hundreds. Uh, but they can have really big memory. Uh, you can have main memory in the terabyte range. It's expensive, but you can, you can build these machines. The big other uh, parallel form of computation is distributed computing. Again, we have same concept, different processing elements that uh, can compute, but they have private memory. And they send explicit messages to communicate. So there's some network connection on top of the uh, individual machines. And so they can only communicate by sending messages across the network. Think of a, a cluster or a compute center of the old style, uh, at least, where um, the machines are fairly separate. So this is a different scenario. And you can maybe imagine that here, the bottleneck will be the messages. Uh, if the network, the network usually is orders of magnitude slower than the rest. And so the real dominating factor is the messages. And that's a bit of a, a different world. Uh, it needs different trade-offs. Now, supercomputers, I think these days are somewhere in between, because they are distributed systems by the setup. They, are composed of individual machines, but they're connected by so fast network that they can almost be treated like a shared memory machine in some regards. So sometimes the distinction is not so clean. Uh, for, for us, keep this in mind. Uh, a single big beefy machine uh, with a couple dozen of processing elements and huge shared memory. That's the, the main thing I, I have in mind for this. Um, for this model. The way we will model this, remember we want eternal truths. So we want statements of the kind, no algorithm can possibly do this better than so-and-so, to compare it to the algorithms you do have. And for these statements, you need uh, a formal machine model that tells you what are programs like and uh, how is performance measured. 
And for this unit, uh, that's the PRAM, the Parallel Random Access Machine. You may remember the RAM model. I hope you do. The PRAM differs from that by having several processing elements. No surprise. Now, the, the rest might be a little awkward at first. So kind of um, bear with me and, and pay attention. So every of these processing elements has an ID. And we always assume 0 up to p minus 1 are the IDs. Uh, and they can use this in their program. I'll come back to that. They also have, uh, it's a still the word RAM model. So they operate in, in words of so and so many bits, w bits. And that's a parameter of the model. Remember, we used to think the word size is, is roughly like logarithmic in the input size. And now we have another parameter, p, which the number of processors also can depend on n. So our machines grow with the problems. I've discussed this back then a bit more. Maybe it's no longer such a shock to you. It's not unusual that for the algorithm formulation, we just assume we have as many processing elements as we'll have inputs. This is not usually realistic, but it's also not usually a problem for designing the algorithm. And I'll, um, uh, I'll show you why um, in a couple of slides. But the thinking for designing the algorithm should be, you have loads of processors, no shortage of processors. Uh, each of these, this should really say the same. All of these processing elements run a standard RAM program, as we've done it all the time, at least under the hood. And this time, we assume they all run the same one. Uh, and they run this to a good degree synchronously. So one time step is the same for all the processing elements. They run in lockstep. Uh, they do a step at a time. They can't do different things because they can use their ID as, as a variable in the code. So they can branch off in different directions depending on which processing element it is. Uh, each PE has its own registers, but the large memory, the unbounded memory of the RAM model is shared. So they all access the same one. And I already said they, they run synchronously. Um, and so that makes it easy for us to define time. We can just count time steps again. If you're worried about how realistic the model is, that's usually the, the part that needs extra work. This is not how current hardware realizes parallel processing. Um, what almost all software stacks above that do is establish some sort of synchronization. And so you can essentially emulate this. The question is how costly it is. So this, this is the engineering part I alluded to. There's some constant factor overhead uh, involved in synchronizing the different PEs. And the goal in practice will be not to do this too fine granular, not, not after every little step. And often you don't have to. But for designing the algorithms, it's very liberating to ignore that part and worry about it separately. So it's two separate concerns. And the good parallel algorithms that work on the PRAM, unless they exploit this, this very, very much, also yield good algorithms in practice on the, the machines that we have. Now, there's one problem that uh, if, if you think about this for a while, um, we say all the different processing elements run happily their program. A RAM program can involve reading and writing memory. So it could happen that two processing elements at the same time, remember, they run synchronously, lockstep. Uh, they could both try to write a value to one location in memory. And so we have a, a write conflict at this point. And we have to somehow resolve this. Now, as a theoretician, that is a question of the model. What should happen? And there's, there's different models which restrict what the programmer is allowed to do. Um, and they're, they're all reasonable in their way. One model is the exclusive read, exclusive write PRAM. Uh, I know these, these acronyms are uh, aw awful, but um, that's, that's how it's stuck. So I think uh, it's best to just remember what this stands for. 
So the exclusive read, exclusive write, parallel random access machine model uh, just restricts the programs so that it never happens that any two processing elements at any point in time read or write the same location. Very restrictive, but no, at no point will that ever happen uh, that we get this, this conflict situation. If you think about it for reads, it's actually not so controversial. What should, what should possibly go wrong if they both read the same location? They will read the same value. Uh, not much harm done. So the, the crew PRAM uh, allows concurrent reads, but enforces exclusive writes. That kind of still has no problem. Just the writes cannot go to the same location at the same time. And, and again, um, so you should think about these models as before they start running, they look at the program. And if the program contains writes at the same point, they somehow magically recognize that and say, nope, I'm not even starting. It's the programmer that has to prove this upfront, that your algorithm satisfies the restrictions. So it's really a restriction on the programs, not necessarily the machine itself. Uh, the, the crew is often the model that we'll think of because that's what, what programmers often find easy to work with because that is free of weird things. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not what current hardware does. Um, but again, I, I said that uh, one of the complications is getting performance right in this space is tough. And so there's usually hardware that does one thing, software above it, that tries to restrict the most confusing things from happening. The other model is the, the concurrent read, concurrent write PRAM, which just allows everything. But now you have to somehow say what happens if two processing elements write to the same location. You can resolve this in a different way. A simple option, sounds awkward, but can be really powerful is uh, the common <laughs> uh, CRCW PRAM that only allows concurrent writes if they have the same value. Then again, no conflict, really. Uh, another option is the arbitrary one. <laughs> and unfortunately, so this, <laughs> this is where your computer does, almost. Uh, you are allowed to write to the same location, but the abstraction doesn't guarantee you what happens, really unless you put other mechanisms in place to synchronize the writes to make sure that they're properly ordered logically, uh, anything can happen. That's what we call a race condition, and that's what plagues parallel programmers day in, day out. And I think we still haven't found a really good solution for this that is at the same time easy to use and exploits the, the hardware to maximal performance. Uh, maybe we'll never do this. Maybe it's never, never going to be possible. Uh, so this, this is closest to the hardware, but if you can design a parallel algorithm to live in this space, no concurrent writes, it'll be much easier and faster to implement on the real machine. That's why this is our default, but it makes sense to keep all in, in mind as possibilities. Uh, last slide on, on the model, I think, is um, what is the cost of an execution? Because we have several processing elements now, this is maybe a little less obvious. But space is still clear. It's just the total memory that uh, is used by any of the processing elements. Uh, time, a natural way to define is just the total number of time steps till all of the processing elements have finished. Uh, the make span in, in other terminology. So this is. This is the real wall clock time you have to wait if you start the computer and wait till all the processing elements are done. It's often also called uh, not time, because that's a bit ambiguous, but depth or span. Uh, pick the term you like best. Um, depth alludes to uh, a visualization where you, you say, uh, what. What can run in parallel is next to each other, and what cannot be parallelized goes below. And so then the depth becomes the number of time steps. Now, this is new. We'll have a, a third one, a third metric that will be almost as important as the other. That's work. And that's just the total instructions ac executed across all processing elements. 
You might wonder why you care about this. Uh, an easy one is that's probably proportional to the energy you're using, which is much more of a, of a discussion these days, especially in, in, compu in cloud compute centers. But there's another reason that we'll come to why, why work cannot be ignored. What are we aiming for, in, in theory at least, is minimal time, as always. We like to be fast. Um, but we can't ignore work. So the best possible we can hope for is what people call a work-efficient algorithm. So that's an algorithm that's essentially as good as the best sequential method in terms of work. So you take, you take a, an algorithm that only works sequentially. That gives you a theta class of the running time. In the usual way, we usually think about the worst case and so on. You take that theta class, that's your goal for the work of your parallel algorithm. So in a way, it's supposed to spend, at most a constant factor, more total effort, but somehow squeeze that in time uh, so that can, it can just be run in parallel on several processing elements. OK? Other three, do the three things make sense? Space, time, and work, or uh, space, span, and work? Now, a little uh, corner case uh, for you to ponder. Whenever we define a notion, it's useful to think about whether we're talking about the empty set, and nothing can possibly ever be work efficient. I'll wait till 40 people have voted. That's what we eventually had on the attendance code. <laughs> Unless we're stuck at 35 forever. All right, so there we go. Yeah, it sounds like um, you should expect always to have this, but no, you can always have a work efficient algorithm. Now the trick is, um, it doesn't say that this has to be a fast parallel algorithm in terms of time, it just says work efficient. So you just take the best sequential algorithm that is work efficient. It's probably a crappy parallel algorithm unless you spend some time on it. By the way, uh, like you don't need to change your vote now to reflect that you've known it up front and it's all... Um, I, won't, I won't look at these results. Also, the video shows that you changed your mind. It's always fun to watch. Uh. <laughs> so one, one more reason for the recordings, right? All right. Uh, So the simple reason is you can take the sequential one, but again, um, the real interesting question is uh, one that also improves the parallel time, and there it's not so clear. I want to finish this, this introduction on the model with an important argument that um, I think is often like <laughs> is sometimes lost in the discussion, and it's very unfortunate. People often complain about the PRAM model that it's unrealistic because it assumes you have this humongous number of processing elements. And, and I think that point is, is missing the point. The other part, that it assumes the synchronous time steps, I take that uh, criticism. That, that makes sense. And you have to worry about how to realize for some of the algorithms um, 
on the more relaxed hardware that we have. The number of processors is not really a problem. Uh, and the reason is Brent's theorem, which says whenever you have some parallel algorithm with span t and work w, or time t, work w, I'll use span to avoid the confusion with time. Uh, I can already remember some of the slides down. So I sometimes use span to avoid the confusion with time. Uh, you can also call it parallel time. That's is all the time we define, the number of time steps, till everyone's finished. So you have an algorithm with time t work w. Uh, then you can always simulate that algorithm on a specific PRAM that has p processing elements in time that's <clears throat> not t, but t plus w divided p, and roughly the same work. So in a way, uh, before we look into how, why that's true, uh, I want to point out this, um, this corollary of this. Uh, didn't want to cross it out. If you have a, a theoretical algorithm on the PRAM that assumes whatever number of processors, it is actually a family of algorithms that could be tailored to any number of PEs. And if you know the work and span of this theoretical algorithm with as many processing elements as you want, you can always translate it to real time and, and uh, work bounds for a specific number of processing elements. And so you can, you can predict fairly well roughly how well it will do. And so it's, um, it's much more useful than it first sounds. Now the argument, you will be disappointed by the proof of this theorem because it's very simple and also shows that um, there's a constant factor overhead paid in terms of the time that may not be negligible. Uh, let's suppose we have a PRAM algorithm that uses many processors. And let's suppose many means five, so I, I finish the drawing at some point. Um, and so I'll, I'll draw the, the time downwards. This is time. We have time step one, two, three, four, and so on. And then um, let me draw the instruction that each uh, processing element does. So it could be um, that we have five processing elements working on this, and they each do some instruction in time step one. Uh, then they do some other instruction in time step two. Uh, and another in time step three. Maybe this time not everything, uh, not everyone participates because some are already done. Um, and maybe here's this just one, but then say in time step five, they all come together and finish off whatever they've done. So how, how can it come to these gaps? They all execute the same program, but they re remember they can use their processing element ID. So they might be idling around uh, during some steps and wait for the others. Uh, so that's we'll, we'll see examples that's possible. Now let's suppose we have to simulate this. on a PRAM with only three processing elements. So how would you do it? Well, yeah, you only have the three processing elements. So, uh, okay, start at zero. So all you can really do is pick one of these tasks at a time. So you take the first three, put them here. Uh, and then there's two left, so you need another time step where the same processing elements now do the remaining two. So what you do is just round robin schedule the tasks that you need to do. And you may need a little more time to do this if all the processing elements participated, but uh, sometimes you can do it in the same time. Sometimes you need an extra step. How bad is this algorithm in terms of time? 
First of all, the work is almost the same. You need a little overhead uh, for the scheduling, who does what. Um, I'm only sketching this very high level. Uh, so work will be similar, just um, a little overhead per step. Now, if you look at each of these, maybe I need to turn this off. How long is this? Well, it's, uh, it's the number, um, it's the number of processors. Um, we don't have a, an, let's call this P prime. That's the, or, or, or big P for, because that's larger. And now we divide it by the little p. That's how many rounds I need, and I have to round up. Now I do this for every time step. And if I sum this up, uh, I have at most p, at most capital P in each step. But actually, if you sum it up, you can only have as much as you have work on the right. So the total number of boxes is the work. So if you sum up this term over all the faces we've done on the left, this capital P will sum to work. In a way, it's how many are active at each point in time. So it's... Um, I should have introduced proper notation for this, but if, if you say capital PI is the number of processing elements that are active in step I, then PI divided P rounded up is the number of rounds you have to do uh, in, this, in this round robin schedule. And if you sum these up over all the times, then the pi is summed to w, but because of the rounding up, you need to add a plus t. You have at most plus one in each step. Uh, let me smuggle in a, an intermediate step here to make that clearer. If you round something up, you can always bound that by adding one and, and drop the rounding. And then uh, that sums to w over p plus t. OK? So at least in theory, you can always simulate whatever parallel algorithm you have on the number of processing elements your machine has, and you still get a reasonable estimate for the time. Now, if this time is good or not, uh, depends, right? It depends on T and it depends on W.